Good morning. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Darshan Mehta. I'm the Associate Director of Education for the Osher Center for Integrated Medicine here at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School and a Medical Director at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind Body Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, we're really excited here um, to have our Grand Rounds presentation. Um, and I'll introduce our uh, speakers in just a moment. Just wanted to uh, remind everyone uh, and invite everyone for our, so our Grand Rounds series, which alternates between a clinical case presentation, which you will hear today, and a research presentation, which will be next month uh, on April 4th. It will be presented by Dr. Chen Chen Wang who is going to be talking about Tai Chi and muscle, musculoskeletal pain. So we invite you again to come here uh, at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, April 4th. Our um, subsequent, uh, I mean, after we complete this presentation, we, have, we encourage you to stay for our, our coffee hour. It's just across the hall where you can continue the discussion. Uh, um, f um, uh, from today's presentation as well as other um, uh, just uh, meeting each other and, and continuing building our community here of uh, scientists, clinicians, and educators around integrative uh, therapies. So today we're really pleased to uh, present uh, the New England School of Acupuncture team. Uh, and the presenters are, uh, are Dr. Uh, Maria Broderick. She's the Associate Professor and Director of Clinical Education for the New England School of Ac Acupuncture, which is now a part of the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, uh, as well as Emily Gerber, who is a master's in acupuncture uh, candidate. And our discussant is Dr. Meenakshi Kumar, who is uh, assistant professor at Boston University School of Medicine in the Department of Family Medicine. So uh, with that, uh, Maria. Thank you, Darshan. We're really pleased to be able to talk about our work with adolescents at Boston Medical Center this morning. And I wanted to um, kick it off, actually, with a little bit of a background and discussion on the work we've been doing in pediatric acupuncture at Boston Medical Center for about 12 years to give you a sense of the context in which this care is provided. Uh, and then Emily and I will present the case and talk a little bit about our rationale because this is a teaching clinic, we also want to talk a little bit about clinical reasoning and how it develops, um, how the conversation unfolds between the intern and the preceptor. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Kumar, who will discuss both those aspects, both the approach that we took to our treatment and also a little bit about how medical education and integrative medicine is um, consistent with some of the best practices of medical education in, in allopathic medicine. And then we'll open it up to questions. So as Darshan mentioned, we are um, from the New England School of Acupuncture. Um, we have two campuses currently in Newton and Worcester. And we recently merged with the Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, as you mentioned, which gives us um, access to uh, schools of um, physical therapy, uh, pharmacy, uh, OT, uh, nursing, and PA. So we have an interprofessional community now of graduate students uh, that are associated with our um, programming. But um, the affiliation that's most important for us to talk about this morning is our longstanding connection to Boston Medical Center. Our acupuncture interns have been providing clinical services at Boston Medical Center for 12 years. We have a strong teaching partnership, and we have two teaching clinics at Boston Medical Center. We're in family medicine, where we see patients of all ages, and we're in pediatrics, where we actually have three environments of care. Our interns see patients on the inpatient service, where we collaborate with residents and nurses and identifying families who have children that might benefit from our services. Um, and in the inpatient setting, we see children of all ages, right up from newborns, uh, through young children, adolescents, and older adolescents. And we treat everything on the inpatient unit from illness to injury. Um, and we see a number of children who are admitted for care of sickle cell crisis as we have a partnership with hematology and oncology. Our second context of care, which is really the focus of our conversation today, is the adolescent outpatient clinic, where we've been seeing patients for 11 years. 
And in that clinic, we collaborate with the PCPs. They refer adolescents to us for a wide range of concerns. Um, and the case um, that we're going to talk about today is kind of a good demonstration of the work that we do in collaboration with care providers in adolescent medicine. And then finally, our newest relationship at Boston Medical Center in pediatrics is with the Pediatric Pain Clinic. We're part of an interprofessional collaborative team there that's led by Dr. Caitlin Neary. Uh, she's a hematologist oncologist, but also a pain specialist. And it was her sort of innovation that brought us to the Pediatric Pain Clinic. So we collaborate with Dr. Neary and a team that includes a clinical psychologist who's an expert in pediatric pain management, a physical therapist who does an initial assessment, a nurse practitioner who is a specialist in integrative nursing, a massage therapist, pediatric massage therapist, a karate teacher from a program uh, locally in Boston that provides karate training for children who have chronic pain, and then our interns who see the children for acupuncture. So it's, it's quite an interesting innovative interprofessional collaboration working with children who are referred to us from neurology, hematology, oncology, rheumatology, GI, et cetera. And it's part of our program to also collaborate with BU and BMC on doing research in each of these environments. Um, so one of our focus areas in the inpatient unit is working with infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome. We've actually developed an acupressure protocol that we've been using with these babies for a decade. We've done a retrospective chart review of over 50 cases of the effects of our treatment on those babies, and we've got enough promising results to be planning now with neonatology, a prospective study of the work that we do with these infants. We've also published on the innovations in our adolescent outpatient clinic. Um, when we first designed this clinic in cooperation actually with medical anthropology at BU, there was a question of whether or not if we put uh, acupuncture clinic in the adoles adolescent outpatient unit, would um, children being seen, adolescents being seen in a safety in the hospital utilize our services? And after 12 years of continuous care with a strong referral network, um, the answer to that question is yes. They will come if you build an adolescent outpatient uh, acupuncture clinic in a safety net hospital. And then finally, um, most recently, we've been doing work, doing research on our pediatric pain service. And just last year, we published a piece in medical acupuncture talking about the development of our pediatric pain clinic and the early results we're seeing from this collaborative form of care. So it's a deep partnership. It involves both um, clinical care and research. And um, we are proud to be representing both NISA and BMC here today. So specifically, our teaching clinic um, sees children of all ages, right from infancy in the inpatient unit up to late adolescence. Um, we do offer acupuncture, but not every child, as you can imagine, or every family is comfortable with the idea of providing acupuncture. So we actually provide the full range of um, services that a TCM provider, traditional Chinese medicine provider, would be able to offer. So we do some Tui Na, which is a form of Chinese pediatric medical massage. Uh, we offer non-insertive techniques, so these are using tools that uh, it stimulate the acupuncture points without actually inserting a needle. So you can see a picture here of this little infant being treated by one of our interns as part of our protocol for working with babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and then we do use needles on the floor, both inpatient and outpatient for older kids and some younger children who are open to it and, and actually come to enjoy the experience. We see about 50 kids a month. We have been so doing for a decade. And our referrals come from all over the hospital and now from outside of the hospital as well. We have a partnership with uh, Boston Public Schools where we're starting to train uh, nurses in the schools on how to do some uh, light interventions for headache and other forms of pain. And all our services are delivered free care. So uh, I just want to speak for a moment about the process of clinical supervision and acupuncture because Emily and I are going to co-present this case and I want you to have an understanding of how we work together. 
um, in developing our clinical reasoning about the appropriate approach to take um, in treating our kids. So acupuncture uh, graduate students um, complete three to four years of graduate education. In the course of their training, uh, they see up to 900 cases. Uh, they start as assistants in the clinic, and then they kind of uh, advance to being an intern. And in the process of being an intern, they have um, a significant set of responsibilities in terms of making a decision about how to approach the case. So the intern does the initial intake. It's, it's pretty similar to um, doing, gathering a history of the present illness in, in an allopathic setting. Uh, they look at the health history. They do the intake with a patient. And then they do a TCM physical exam, which is pretty straightforward. It's a combination of taking the pulses on both sides, looking for uh, the quality, the rate, the depth, and some other sort of characteristics of the pulse that we learn in pulse diagnosis. They examine the tongue. Uh, they look for color and shape and coating. And in some cases, there's also some palpation. Uh, could be abdominal palpation, or if there's, um, you know, depending on the presentation, there might be also some physical assessments. So they do all of that, and then they come and they sit down with their preceptor, and that's me in this case, and they present the case. And at that point, they are expected to have an organized understanding of what they've been, they've um, understood from the case. They need to have arrived at a diagnosis and a treatment plan, present that in a systematic fashion, and then after having presented it with their approach to treatment, the supervisor does her own version of the physical exam, and then the intern treats the patient, and then the supervisor does a little bit of a kind of quality check on the location and insertion of the needles. So the case is led by the intern, the clinical reasoning is led by the intern, and the preceptor serves as a kind of feedback and um, oversight. From the point of view of precepting, um, our job is to make sure that the intern commits to a diagnosis and the treatment plan that's going to flow from it. We don't want an intern to present the case to us in a way that suggests that we need to lead the diagnosis. They need to commit to what they see in front of them and make a decision about the treatment plan. And then we probe for their reasoning related to the signs and symptoms presented in the case. We teach them many general rules um, about the case specifically. If they haven't encountered um, some facet of the case previously, we give them good, strong, positive feedback, and we correct any errors to ensure that there's no safety or quality issues in terms of the treatment. So our teaching clinic, so this case comes from our teaching clinic is kind of what I'm trying to say here. Um, Emily led the case. Emily made the decisions about how the case should be approached. And um, this was a 17-year-old African-American adolescent um, being treated at Boston Medical Center where she receives her primary and specialty care. And let me tell you a little bit about the history of the case. So um, from her reporting, from the reporting of the adolescent and confirmation by her mother, uh, her set of symptoms began in Honduras. She, she was born in the United States, moved to Honduras uh, when she was nine. And when she was a teen, she was chatting with a friend outdoors um, when suddenly she had the sensation of something that felt like a bug flying into her ear. And Subsequent to that, she developed pain in her cheek, and then the pain fairly quickly transformed into numbness in the cheek, the lip, and the tongue. Um, at the time, based on her reporting, you know, this was some time ago in another country, she had no upper respiratory infection. She had no trauma to the head. She had not recently had any kind of dental procedure or anything that would impact um, the trigeminal nerve, um, and she had been told by her friends that they had observed her drooling, although she did not have a consciousness that she was drooling. She, they were observing that she had this drooling down her face, um, and that her eye on the left side also was drooping in Honduras. And then somewhere between 2011 and 2014, when she returned to the United States, she did have um, her uh, third molars extracted. So she did have a dental procedure post the origin of the numbness, um, but she doesn't recall the date. So then she came to the United States to go to college, and she was seen by her 
PCP because this numbness was persisting for three years now. Um, plus, she had um, fairly severe, severe dysmenorrhea, which she wanted some attention for, and then she was, had, at this point, also developed an intermittent headache. Um, based on uh, the full history of the present illness, um, her PCP referred her for a consult to neurology. She had an MRI. We'll look at that in a second, but there were really no significant findings. And at the time she presented to neurology, she had now also developed bilateral shoulder pain. And she had a lump on her right shoulder. Um, her GERD, which had been sort of uh, intermittent, um, was much worse now that she was living in the United States. And she had a fungal infection on her skin. And the dysmenorrhea was persisting. So the MRI showed no, um, really there were no uh, findings of interest with the exception of she had some thickening of the mucosal lining in her ethnoid sinus. Everything else was pretty much um, inconclusive. She was referred to ENT. At that point, she now had developed some eye pain and blurry vision. Um, she had uh, an earache when she presented there, and she had this sort of sound, like a, a sensation in the ear where the, she had felt the, the sensation of a bug flying in the ear. She had this sort of like throbbing noise. Um, her hearing was now a little bit impaired. She had a sore throat, dysphagia to all consistencies of food, and some dizziness and imbalance. But on, you know, on assessment, her ears looked normal, and um, the ENT was concerned that perhaps there was a mass that hadn't been identified in the MRI because it might have been at the base of the skull. So eventually she was assessed for that. No masses. And um, from the point of view of further assessment, there was no obvious sort of structural pathology uh, present. OK, oh, one more thing I just want to say. Um, this, uh, you see that this background picture is actually a picture of the beach in Honduras. And um, in Chinese medicine, which we're going to get to in a little bit when we think about diagnosis, there are various environmental factors that we pay attention to in some presentations. And so there's an entire category of TCM diagnosis which relates to wind. And uh, we were talking about this case because eventually our diagnosis does involve um, a pattern that relates to wind. And Emily asked me if I knew anything about the climate in which um, our patient was living at the time of this wind strike, as we call it, the sensation of this foreign body in the ear. And I looked into it a little bit. It turns out Honduras and the area in Honduras where she was living is, is really windy. In fact, there's a windy season, and it's so well known for its wind that um, there's a significant kiteboarding um, kind of is a, is a big um, pastime there. So this is a picture of the beach in Honduras where uh, she was living at the time with the wind uh, in play. But then she moves to Boston to go to college. And at that point, she develops some TMJ. Um, she now has some sensitivity to metal in her teeth. Um, the shoulder pain is persisting. And now she's complaining of sinusitis, which seemed to have worsened in the change of environment. And at this point, she's referred initially to acupuncture. So she has acupuncture for three months, got some improvement. Um, this was with a prior intern, not Emily. And in, in light of that, um, she had another consult to oral surgery who basically um, summarized it as a confusing clinical picture, um, saying that there was probably um, you know, some involvement of uh, V2 and V3 from the trigeminal, trigeminal nerve, that that picture of her presentation was consistent with uh, TN, except that there was no pain, um, and she had no masses, and she had gotten some relief from acupuncture. So in this assessment, now we're in uh, 2016, the surgeon did not suspect trigeminal neuralgia, but now has MS on her differential. At this point, she starts losing weight. She's referred to nutrition for a consult. The weight loss is fairly dramatic, although she had been lean um, historically, and now she's starting to drop some weight. Uh, there's a mole on her left cheek, which is excised and um, shown to be benign. 
Okay. And then in terms of the sort of just uh, her medical history, she does have asthma, history of um, pollen allergies. The GERD is persistent throughout. As I mentioned, she has this skin infection, this dysmenorrhea. And then another feature of her case that isn't really relevant in any of the allopathic summaries but was interesting to us is she complains of palpitations. Most specifically, when she lies down, she feels palpitations but also a kind of sensation of heaviness in her chest. And we don't know too much about her immunization history. Of course, they, were, uh, they caught her up on her immunizations in Boston. And then just briefly, her social history. She was born here. She moved to Honduras at the age of nine, no other travel. Returned to Boston uh, for college in 2015, is studying nursing, lives at home with her mom, grandma, and some sibs. And um, a very important, uh, significant other uh, moved recently from Honduras to Boston to be with her, so um, starting to develop an important relationship. No meds for trigeminal neuralgia were ever given to her. She didn't have the pain presentation. She had just the numbness, so she's been basically medicated for her asthma and allergies and the fungal infection. So if we look at this as a picture of unilateral facial numbness, which is really what it is because she doesn't really have a TN diagnosis, she doesn't have the persistent pain and it's sort of persisted for three years, Here's just a reminder um, for those of you who are uh, physicians of the differential for facial numbness. So it could be a severe acute infection. It could be trauma, um, in which would include a dental procedure. It could be a tumor. It might um, be arising from a more systemic disease like MS, which uh, was added to the differential. Maybe a vascular event could produce some of these symptoms, autoimmune disorders, genetic disorders. And then, to the best of our knowledge, she doesn't have anything consistent with exposure to pesticides or toxins that would be um, part of that differential as well if she had an occupation and those, um, all of her symptoms started um, when she was still a teenager, so it wasn't working anywhere. So on that differential, it's split between causes of sudden onset and um, causes of gradual onset, and this is actually a bit of a mixed story because we have the sudden onset of that feeling of the bug flying into her ear and then the presentation of the initial symptoms, um, but then they persist for many years and they start to kind of migrate and, you know, we see from our point of view as um, acupuncturists, we see these symptoms of shoulder pain and other forms of pain and numbness arising as all related to this case. Um, but if you just think about the different the differential around the sudden acute onset around it could be trauma or infection or a vascular event or some kind of malignancy, um, they break it down into different ways that you would look for those signs and we have a kind of mixed presentation. Our, our patient doesn't have a history of trauma, um, but she does have some signs consistent with trauma. Now we know she did have the dental procedures post the initial event. So now she does have that sensitivity to touch. She, in fact, can't use silverware. She has to use plasticware because putting a spoon against her teeth provokes the symptoms. Um, she does not re have any memory of any kind of acute infection prior to, but we're talking about an adolescent you know, reporter of symptoms. Possibly she did, and she, she doesn't recall it. Um, there's no vascular event that's been identified, but we do have this interesting sort of history around her having this drooping and the drooling observed by her peers. And there's no evident malignancy, but now we have this more recent picture of suddenly this drop in weight, right? So there's, there's no sort of evident um, presentation related to this sort of uh, expected causes. Um, so that's the biomedical picture. It's mixed. It's not conclusive. It's still an evolving picture. But we don't really use that um, picture. We are, we're interested in it. We review the history. But from the point of view of an acupuncturist, the way that we approach determining how we're going to treat is we do our own workup, traditional Chinese medicine workup. And from our point of view, some of the features of the case that kind of directed us to a diagnosis were the sudden onset that's, that's telling um, in terms of our differential. Um, the migrating location of the numbness and pain and how it kind of traveled 
over time in a specific kind of way that's indicative to us. The, um, the history of the, the fungal infection is relevant, and actually I should probably include here too the sinusitis, this sort of damp presentation um, that is uh, part of our understanding of the picture. And then also in our inspection of the tongue, we see one of the features of our tongue inspection is that she has a deviation in her tongue. It's, it's pointed to the left, and in Chinese medicine we pay attention to not only the shape and the color of the tongue, but also if, it, if it's moving, if it's wagging, if it's deviated, that points us in the direction of a, cat, a wind category diagnosis. And then the pulse um, as well, uh, as well as some of the coating in the tongues pushed us in the direction of a specific pattern to assess. But just as in you know, allopathic medicine, there are um, you know, differentials you go down in a TCM diagnosis, and so there are a number of candidates for the diagnosis that um, would be relevant in, in this kind of a mixed picture. But ultimately, um, we decided that her diagnosis from a TCM standpoint was an original sort of wind damp invasion that led to um, a kind of occlusion in the channels, local chi and blood stagnation, especially as related to the shoulder pain. So that's a TCM diagnosis. Um, so let's talk about the treatment. Emily's going to present uh, how she worked through her decision making around what points to use. Good morning. Um, so in choosing the points, we use a couple different uh, techniques. So first, we use a local technique. So based on the fact that this patient had this foreign body feeling in their ear, uh, one of the points that I chose was gallbladder 2. Um, this meridian actually flows through the ear and the face, uh, which is particularly relevant for this patient. Also, I chose stomach four, which is another local facial point. Um, the area of most acute numbness was in this area, and the stomach channel flows right through the face, which is where most of the numbness was located. Secondarily, we use distal or systemic points uh, to treat. So one of those points is large intestine four, which is located on the hand. This is actually a command point for the face and mouth that regulates the face, eyes, nose, mouth, and ears, and expels wind, which you heard Maria mention. I also chose to use stomach 44, which is a distal point on the stomach channel. Um, as you may remember, I used stomach 4, which is more locally located on the face, but by using a point on the opposite end of the channel, I'm able to affect that facial region. So part of the presentation of this patient was this shoulder pain. And when she first presented, um, it was somewhat acute. And so I really wanted to treat this and provide some relief for the patient. So I used a, um, the first point, Sanjiao 14, which is more of a traditional shoulder point. It relieves shoulder pain. It's a point on the affected channel. As you may recall, our diagnosis was wind damp in the Sanjiao. This is a more distal point on that channel. I also used a more contemporary technique, um, an innervation zone of the levator scapula to help uh, reduce the neck tension. This patient tested positively for some range of motion assessments um, that indicate the involvement of the levator scap. So this patient was seen weekly for 45 minute sessions. At the second session, uh, patient saw sensation returning to her face. By the fourth session, she felt sensation returning to her lips. By the eighth session, she was able to feel her tongue and her internal mouth. She was able to chew on the left side. And by the tenth session, the patient was mostly free of facial numbness, and most of the sensation had returned. So this is a more detailed overview of the treatments that we used. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few key points. After the first treatment, I decided to place more emphasis on the shoulder based on that range of motion assessment. At that point, I added in the innervation zone for the levator scap. Uh, some of these other points also treat the shoulder. 
And so I saw that as I was treating the shoulder tension in conjunction with the facial numbness, the facial sensation was returning more quickly. At session six, I added a technique um, called cupping, which continues to work on the shoulder tension. This is also accessing some other areas, the upper trapezius, the supra and infraspinatus muscles, which are part of the rotator cuff. And so by session 10, uh, the facial numbness had mostly resolved and the shoulder tension had loosened. For those of you who are not familiar with the cupping technique, it was made very popular in the Olympics by Michael Phelps. Um, and it is a technique where we use suction cups to pull the, the muscle in and it release, releases the tension. I will turn this back over to Maria. Okay, so our rationale in terms of um, you know, first of all, just thinking about using acupuncture as a modality in this case. Um, we have a case here where we have a sudden onset of um, facial pain and numbness, but no clear determination of what um, the medical diagnosis is. And also the facial pain has uh, resolved, and now we just have this numbness that persists for years. It's quite uncomfortable for our teen. Um, and isn't responding to any other treatment. In fact, there really isn't any other treatment being offered to her. There's multiple assessments, but there's no other treatment being offered to her for, to alleviate this, um, you know, sort of irritating sensation of numbness that's actually impacting her ability to eat comfortably. And uh, because there's no medical or surgical treatment, it does, this is a, it's, you know, a, a relevant case for thinking about what can integrative medicine offer. Um, but there's no self-evident approach to take um, biomedically. And as long as we know that there are integrative approaches that are safe and appropriate for adolescents, as we've sort of attested to by our decade-long experience of treating adolescents at Boston Medical Center safely. We feel that we can make the case for at least trying acupuncture as an approach to see if we can give her some relief. Um, and we know from our own experience that it's safe, but there's also some an evidence base um, that suggests that acupuncture is pretty safe for children, so we don't have some um, concerns about risk management if we introduce acupuncture in this case. And, you know, we think it's important that if you're going to work with children, especially when you have a presentation where there's kind of a mixed story of what's going on, it's not exactly clear medically what's happening yet for our patient, we want to offer acupuncture in a place where everyone is comfortable. The team that is um, working with our adolescent is comfortable with our team. They know us. She's referred to us directly by the PCP. And in fact, we actually see adolescents in the same clinic where their um, docs are working with our patients and we have opportunities for those conversations, warm handoffs, um, as we're picking up patients in the ambulatory care center. Um, so not only does our PCP have a comfort level with what we're doing, we can um, also uh, keep her other providers informed through communications in the medical record, et cetera. Um, so, in cases where you do have this persistent numbness, given that Emily had some significant success in treating a symptom that had basically persisted for three years, and in a few weeks um, we saw some uh, real resolution of the symptoms um, to the great relief of our teen and her mom, um, so we just want to sort of bring this to your attention as a possible approach to care if you have um, a similar presentation. Um, you know, but the question, uh, you know, the important question is, is there an evidence base from the point of view of um, research that's been done on similar cases where acupuncture is used successfully? And, you know, the direct answer is not really, because there are, this is a fairly unusual case. You have this sort of mixed presentation. We don't have a literature on treating facial numbness with acupuncture in adolescents. But we do have some literature that points to some understanding of what you know, how it might be helpful or, or safe. Um, so we've taken a look at some of that literature. We looked at the literature on acupuncture for um, TN. Uh, again, she doesn't have the persistent pain um, in her face, but we do know that um, from a systematic review of the acupuncture literature on TN, um, looking at 12 studies with 
um, in the kind of classic design of these studies is you put uh, one uh, group, um, the study group uh, receive acupuncture and the control group receive the sort of standard uh, medical treatment, which is a uh, um, course of treatment with CBZ. And in the case of all of these studies reviewed, the authors uh, do state that they viewed them to be not especially well-designed studies, so the low quality. Um, and in only four of those trials, we saw acupuncture actually improving symptoms um, over and above the outcomes accomplished by a course of uh, treatment with CBZ. Um, and in the remaining eight studies, there was no difference between treatment and control, which still says that acupuncture got good results, similar to the medication. Um, so these authors conclude that, you know, we do need better um, design studies to really determine whether or not acupuncture is superior or at least consistent with um, the standard um, medical care. So we, there's some, some relevance in that. Uh, a chapter published in Headache in Children and Adolescents um, sort of recues on the uh, relative rarity of TN being a diagnosis in, in pediatric populations. Um, but if it is, if it does present, if you do make a diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia in um, children or adolescents, you are going to see a typical pattern, um, uh, the presentation that would be consistent with what you would see in adults. So you would see the pain that would be severe, it would be distributed along the trigeminal nerve, it would be unilateral, um, and that diagnosis would be made based on the character of the pain, the course, the distribution of the pain, the triggers, similar, you know, the sort of sensitivity to pressure, um, and then responses to medication. Of course, she didn't have a trial medication because she didn't have that pain. So we don't really see um, this in kids much, but in this, in this particular chapter, they report on an interesting case that has some similarities to ours of a 14-year-old who, who definitively had a diagnosis of TN, which um, followed a dental procedure. Um, but in her case, like ours, um, the assessments didn't show any sort of damage to the nerve, but nonetheless, um, she did have a presentation that was consistent with the diagnosis of uh, TN, and she did improve um, with, with medication regime. And in her case, the treatment also resolved, like ours, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a sec, in reverse order of appearance of the symptoms. So in our acupuncture um, course of care, we resolved the shoulder pain, and then we resolved, you know, the sort of symptoms resolved in almost reverse order of their appearance. So some similarities there. Um, so if there were pain, the first line of approach would be to medicate with CBZ, but we didn't have pain in our patient. Another interesting case report, um, this is not a, a case of a child, but um, a presentation of uh, post a dental procedure, facial numbness developing, and then a course of acupuncture for that numbness in an adult led to, again, a reversal of the symptoms in reverse order of the way that the numbness developed across the face. Um, so this is post-anesthesia, the numbness persisted. In this case, there was acupuncture treatment, and um, the pattern of resolution went in reverse order of the development of symptoms. For those of you who are acupuncturists here, acupuncture students, and we have some NISA students here, um, in this particular case, the method of care was using the balance method. So um, that's uh, an approach, uh, sort of a specific approach in acupuncture treatment that uses largely distal points, not the local points. And then there's been some interesting work done looking at um, sort of the relationship of the classical literature in Chinese medicine to uh, contemporary understanding of um, anatomical structure, and there's some interesting uh, discussion in the literature about the classic points that Emily chose, including stomach seven, bladder two, stomach two, and a, what we call an extra point on the chin, and how they overlay um, with the structure of the trigeminal nerve. And um, there are some indications that, um, you know, historically, classically, those points were demonstrated to relieve pain in these areas, and if you look at the way they overlay on the nerve, it, it kind of makes, um, it makes sense. Okay, but I just have a couple minutes left on this piece, and I want to make sure we get to the last piece here. 
Um, so we know that it's it's not common to see TN in, in children, and when it does present, um, you sh the evidence suggests or the advice is that you should consider you should put MS on the differential, which her neurologist or her oral surgeon did. Um, and there's not a really good evidence base for acupuncture for MS. There's a lot of case reports that it's effective, especially with some of the pain and numbness. Um, but uh, an evaluation of that literature doesn't really point us to being able to definitively say that acupuncture is going to be helpful in the treatment of MS. Um, but a conclusion from um, this review of the evidence doesn't uh, suggest that actually um, we should continue to work with acupuncture in cases of MS and do uh, better design studies um, before we can make a definitive statement. And finally, I just want to speak to the safety of pediatric acupuncture. In a systematic review of thousands of cases of acupuncture for pediatrics being reported in the literature, a review of the report on adverse events demonstrates that essentially acupuncture is pretty safe for kids. Um, you know, we had only, you know, the summation of this study says that about 12 percent of uh, reports um, on cases of pediatric acupuncture do show some adverse events, but they tend to be very mild, maybe some bruising maybe uh, some discomfort in the region of needling. So our, our story here from a TCM standpoint is that um, our symptoms from the, you know, the initial uh, wind strike or that sensation of the bug in the ear move from pain to numbness to pain to numbness um, in the face to the shoulder to the head. And from the point of view of Chinese medicine, you know, we have this whole theory of the channels and the channel trajectories, and it's a very precise, it's not just sort of like a, um, a hypothesis. The channels are very um, specifically detailed in the, in the direction that they flow, um, and we use that channel theory to make a determination of how we might succeed in um, treating a case. And so, the two channels that were involved, as Emily mentioned, were the San Zhao, also known as the triple warmer or the triple heater, and gallbladder. And in the case of the San Zhao, you can see that the, the, the channel actually travels along the sort of progression of our patient's symptoms. Um, it encircles the ear, it, it moves to the top of the shoulder, and there's even a sort of um, divergent vessel that moves to the chest, which kind of implicates the palpitations and the sense of pressure pain that our patient experienced. Um, so. From my point of view as a supervisor, my focus was on let's work with channel obstruction. Let's treat the channel. Let's pick channel points. Let's work to kind of clear the channel so we can resolve all of these symptoms that follow the channel, even though they're sort of distinctive. In our way of thinking, they're all channel related symptoms. This is gallbladder channel, also encircles the ear, uh, is also related to the location of her, her persistent headaches. Um, and so Emily and I are just going to speak briefly to this, which is that um, in our clinical reasoning conversation, I was advocating to Emily that she think about the channel, the channel theory, work with the channel, and Emily's perspective was that um, her focus on the shoulder was more in keeping with the patient's needs, which I'll let her speak to quickly. Um, and so she convinced me to introduce this levator scap technique which then actually seemed to open the channel and make that progression of uh, resolution of the symptoms unfold. So one thing that we're taught is to really treat what the patient is complaining about. Um, so while the facial numbness was you know, prominently what she was there for, she was experiencing a lot of shoulder tension and pain. Uh, and so I really wanted to treat them in conjunction and so I kind of advocated for the patient in this way. And of course, I wanted to use some of the orthopedic techniques that I'd been taught. And so I saw that that was an effective way to treat both the symptoms and the kind of underlying pathology. Okay. So we are going to turn it over to Dr. Kumar to reflect a little bit both on our kind of approach to using integrative medicine at uh, BMC in primary care and just thinking about uh, medical education and that clinical reasoning. Good morning. Listening to both Maria and Emily speak today validates all of us being here. 
the way I think about medicine and the way medicine has evolved. I've been in practice for 13 years. I'm a family medicine doctor. Then I became a palliative medicine doc and did fellowship in that, and then ended up finding myself in love with integrative health and functional medicine. And I think that's always been a way I've practiced. I think intuitively and being Indian, Ayurveda being a big part of my life, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda ch share a lot of commonalities. These ancient techniques of taking care of people clearly demonstrated today in this case overtook anything else we could provide in the allopathic world, which doesn't negate the importance of both. It actually complements and again, validation that we have this program of integrative health. And the center being able to provide these types of forums where we can speak about this provides the ability to collaborate and understand what other people are doing that we may not necessarily even be aware of. The few things that struck me in this particular case, one was the ability to move away from a treatment plan that we have decided when we see a patient, many of us decide, this is what the patient's diagnosis is, this is what I think would be good for them, and then we stick to that treatment plan, we become attached to it. It's hard to take a step back and say, okay, maybe I should reconsider. Maybe I should think about changing the way we go. And I think residents and the youth that we have let us take a step back a lot more than maybe even we would like to be able to admit to ourselves and understand that there could be another way. So the two things in that particular frame of reference from what Emily has done over there was one, listening to the patient and making that patient be their advocate, hearing what they say, and then taking a step back. The second piece of it is taking a step back and not being attached to what we have decided this person needs. The second piece of the presentation that I loved and was fascinated with was what Maria was talking about with the channels, which goes back to this ancient, these ancient modalities that have been around for thousands of years, who so precisely had channels demarcated. And this particular patient came in with the symptomatology that I would not have, as an allopathic doc, been able to explain with an actual tra trajectory that you can see with that diagram. And that was fascinating from a perspective of, I did not know that that existed. I'd like to know more about that. But also, what does that mean? What is that left for us to still learn about the body and about the things that we still don't know? Which then brings me to a third point, which is the existence of our programs, of integrative health as a division in a hospital setting, in an outpatient setting, the ability to bring in things that are out of the box, thinking in a different way, collaborating with different types of providers so that we can provide for patients those types of techniques that we may be solo and unable to do. Uh, we're lucky that we're in academic environments and institutions that back this up with research, that also have the ability with funding to bring in different types of techniques and different types of practitioners. The ability for us to tell the rest of the society in the Boston University world, we're really lucky. We have a lot of institutions that are doing similar work, but we may not be doing the same work. So the, the networking piece is really important, so we know who is doing what. And when you go back and you think about the fourth thing in this that I thought was really interesting, which we didn't talk enough about, but I want to bring it out, is there was a really strong psychosocial aspect to this patient's case, which we didn't have the time to emphasize, but I'm going to bring it up and Maria can add on to it later on in the discussion if you're interested. The functional medicine doctor in me always wants to know what the reason is that somebody's not feeling well. What is the root cause? And a lot of the times the root cause is esoteric. A lot of the times it's a psychosocial, emotional pain that this person has gone through. This child, when she left to come to America, leaving her boyfriend, she was 14 when she had thought about coming here. She came here when she was 17, correct? That movement, that decision that she had made was really difficult for her. And that was the time that this bug flew, or this sensation. We don't know if it was a bug, but it's a sensation that flew into her ear, and then the resulting symptoms. I really put that out there as a question that none of us really know enough about, but the impact that the mind and the spirit has on the physical body. So when you really look at the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual aspects of somebody's health, they all interplay, and there's always something 
that we might be able to pull out. So in this case, I think there's good reason to put that out there as a question. What is it that could have happened on an emotional level that we might have not been able to explain on an allopathic level that clearly the acupuncture released with this channel, which again, none of us know historically how they designed, which opened up this energy, which allowed this flow that then let this girl be symptom free. So I congratulate you guys on doing this and being able to bring this to the forum here. And thank you for being able to create this kind of a, a forum to talk. Um, and those were my points that I wanted to bring out and leave that open uh, for further discussion. So we just have one uh, quick summary and then we'll move to Q&A. So just to summarize sort of where we've been this morning, um, we have a long-standing teaching clinic at Boston Medical Center where we see um, pediatric patients in multiple environments and we're able to make um, really build access to integrated medicine for safety net uh, patients who couldn't afford our services otherwise. Um, we have talked about a case of a persistent facial paresthesia that was alleviated with a short course of acupuncture. We have student interns in our clinic who are receiving a really robust education. They have this opportunity to work interprofessionally. Um, and they have this uh, fairly unique opportunity um, nationally to really learn about how to diagnose uh, pediatric cases, especially complex cases. Um, and for those of us who work with integrative health uh, care students in these professions. We're learning from them, as uh, Dr. Kumar said. It's uh, just a wonderful gift to be able to have those conversations and change our perspective and um, learn to think differently as people um, come up in the profession. Thank you. Can I have you sit up front? Yeah. Thank you uh, for a really wonderful presentation on, on just a critical look uh, at how we deliver care in, a, um, in the pediatric population, but also in, in sort of a rare condition. Um, so we're going to open up for, I think we have a few minutes for Q&A, uh, uh, and we, we invite you to continue the discussion. But I wanted to ask just two questions to start. One was... Uh, did you wonder or did you ever ask the uh, referring provider as to why a trial of medication hadn't been done? Because it seems like people would have tried something. And number two was, what was the follow-up communication you did with the treatment providers, including the oral maxillofacial surgeon, the neurologist, pediatrician? What type of sort of uh, wrap-up was there or sort of closing the loop on it? Hello? Yeah, it's time. Um, so in, uh, I did actually ask the um, adolescent medicine uh, doc why a course of medication wasn't ever um, provided for a patient. And her answer was the one I sort of implied in my discussion, that uh, there was no persistent pain. Um, the presentation was primarily around numbness. She had had this dental procedure after the numbness originated that seemed to be implicated as well, and that... Um, she had this uh, dysphagia that actually was challenging for her to take certain types of medication. So it was a kind of complex picture, which is why she was referred to us. And then in terms of our follow-up, um, the way that we work at BMC is that we partner primarily with the PCP, or in terms of the pediatric pain clinic, primarily with Dr. Neary, we have access on the medical record to reports from specialists, but we don't directly communicate back to specialists in terms of our course of treatment. We communicate back to the PCP or the medical director of the pain clinic, and if there's follow-up communications to specialists, they handle that. Of course, they can actually see our charting if they're interested, and one um, innovation at BMC is that we've actually um, imported into the medical record a TCM-10 question and pulse and tongue uh, differentiation so they can actually see our TCM process, which they probably don't understand. But most of our communications go back through the PCP. Yeah. 
Um, a, a follow up question about your charting and questions primary care providers and other um, specialists might have looking at your notes, knowing that there are some kind of language differences. Uh, how do you address that, respond to that? Well, you know, Eric, that it's funny because I thought the, the original TCM approach to charting was actually developed by Ellen Highfield when she was at BMC, and she worked with um, Rod Safer and um, the, Michael Groden and a, and a group of physicians there who advised uh, her on how to integrate the TCM intake into the medical record, and then of course we had to get help with the IT team and all of that. And the, they created that working committee because the assumption was when we started putting into the medical record things like spleen sheet efficiency and blood stasis and you know, <laughs> liver yang rise, you know, we would, we would create a little bit of a buzz and people would be saying, what are you doing over there in integrative medicine? We have never in all the years that we've been charting ever been asked a question about our diagnosis, pulse, tongue, our point selection. Nobody has ever raised the issue of the oddness of our language and our pattern differentiation. Are, pe are people cur curious? No. They, no, they're not even <laughs> curious? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, 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 mm -hmm. uh, following up on Darshan's question, the opportunity for dialogue, I think, is so key here. If you have, from, from the point of view of a neurologist, right, the trigeminal nerve is like miles away from innervation of the shoulder. I mean, this is not something that people would go to, and yet that appeared to be a central component of, of sort of getting this, this person to improve was to treat the shoulder. So that kind of um, sort of bridging in, in thinking between two different parts of the body that neurologically are not supposed to be connected. And clearly, there was something here that, that, that changed. And so do you have any comments on that? Like, how, what would it take to have a discussion with a neurologist <laughs> about this? Um, well, I don't want to exclude Emily from this conversation, but just because I've had more of these conversations with physicians. The pediatric pain clinic is the place, our newest innovation, where we have most of these conversations. And that, that's really fascinating. So the structure of the pediatric pain clinic is that we, we, we meet weekly and we discuss our kids that we're seeing. And we talk about the different approaches we're taking to treatment. So PT presents, acupuncture presents. Um, you know, they don't necessarily see every provider, but our massage therapist will present. Caitlin Neary, who is a hemong pain specialist as well, she will present. And we all talk about how we understand the case and why we're taking the approach we're taking. And that is really leading to a rich discussion about how to think about pain from multiple perspectives. Um, so that's where that's happening. And then, you know, we do have uh, examples in adult medicine, family medicine, where we have our docs intentionally talking. In fact, we have um, an interprofessional case conference series that we're doing now with some HRSA funding where we're having those conversations. But um, we are not sitting down with neurologists and talking about our approach yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, and I, so I, I want to sort of invite us now to continue this conversation across the hall. But I would say one of the interesting things that at least um, uh, certainly the clinics uh, here at uh, the Brigham, at MGH, one of the things we do try to do is that even if we don't have a dialogue, certainly the electronic medical record permits us to forward our thinking process directly to the te care team, whoever you determine the care team to be. And so one of the standard practices that many of us have adopted is that we'll still send our Regardless of whether or not the ref the team reads it or not, we will still send our thoughts on the care of the patient directly. And I know Boston Medical Center uses the same electronic medical record that we do too uh, in the Epic system. So we could easily start communication channels. Uh, whether or not someone receives it is obviously on their prerogative, but at least we can have a beginning dialogue. Um, and so we automatically forward our note or plan of action to the referring provider. So we want to invite you to continue across the hall. Again, a reminder that um, next month uh, will be uh, a presentation, research presentation on Tai Chi and musculoskeletal pain uh, that will be led by Dr. Chen Chen Wang from Tufts University Medical Center. 
Uh, we are, again, grateful to our, our uh, team here and a round of applause for their wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.